Howdy! The point of this video is to talk about magnetic materials. What is the origin of magnetism in materials? Now, why do we care about magnetic materials? Well, magnets are at the heart of a lot of current technological systems. So let's think about any sort of generator. It could be a generator on a windmill, it could be a generator in a car, it could be any sort of generator. In all of these cases, um, somehow we're rotating permanent magnets around a coil of wire, and that's creating a uh, electronic current. And so in order to do this, in order to do this compactly and efficiently, I would like very, very strong, but very, very small permanent magnets. Let's think about uh, magnetic storage, right? So at the heart of most of our computers, um, still we have a magnetic hard drive, right? These are advantageous because they can store a lot of information uh, per unit area. And they do that by having a very, very thin metallic film on this disc. And if we look in and we zoom up this area, there are tracks and each of those tracks can have small bits that have the magnetization in one direction or in another. Um, and so those bits are telling us uh, what, what, uh, you know, how, how to store the, um, the information on the hard drive. Let's think about a transformer, right? So anytime I'm changing voltage from a high voltage to a low voltage, uh, I do this typically through the use of a uh, solid state transformer. Um, and so this is usually a soft ferromagnet, so typically something like iron, that's wrapped um, a different number of times uh, between one wire and another wire. And this uh, steps the voltage up or down. So in all of these cases, we need to have magnets and magnetic materials that perform some specific task. They have to have some specific properties. The point of this video is to think about where does magnetism come from in materials. And we're going to start off with the, the classical picture of taking a metal and we can wrap a wire around it. And when we do that, if we flow current through uh, the wire, then we generate a magnetic field. So we'll generate a strong magnetic field within that loop of wire. Um, and if we have a soft ferromagnet in here, something like iron, it's going to get even stronger. And you can see the stray field that comes out around because all of the magnets that we're familiar with are dipoles. There's a positive and a negative side. There's no magnetic monopole that has been observed to exist. So from this picture, we think of moving current as being required to create a magnetic field. So what about in a magnetic material? I don't think about there as being moving current, but on the atomic level, you can think about the electrons moving in the system, right? So electrons within an orbital are always moving. Uh, and so there could be some sort of an orbital contribution to magnetic moment. Also, electrons themselves can have an inherent property uh, that we typically call spin. Um, and that's given by the quantum number m sub s. And so the picture that some people like to draw is this electron spinning like a top. Again, we're sort of impo imposing our classical picture of things spinning on it. Um, that's not necessarily uh, the best physical picture, but we don't really have a good physical picture. So we just know that there's some inherent property uh, of electrons themselves that leads to this magnetic moment from the, uh, the electron contribution. So these two things interact. And so in any atom, um, if I have unpaired electrons, I could have some magnetic moment contribution from either the spin or the orbital uh, contribution, or some kind of combination thereof. So the combinations get a little bit um, tricky, uh, and we're not really going to go into those here. Um, this is based on quantum mechanics, uh, but you can understand the different um, potential magnet, uh, magnetic contributions based on what quantum numbers are uh, satisfied in certain elements. So let's look at a general periodic table. Now remember, um, I told you that we need to have unpaired electrons to get this magnetic contribution. Um, and so what that means is a couple things. First of all, uh, the noble gases are never going to have a residual magnetic moment because they're always closed shell. We never have um, unpaired electrons. Um, so the things that tend to be the most magnetic are those that are kind of in the middle of the transition metal series because we can have a lot of unpaired electrons here, or 
in the middle of the rare earth um, series. So we can have, again, we can have a lot of um, unpaired electrons uh, in, uh, in the middle of these series, right? So think about uh, the rare earth has 14 electrons in those f orbitals. Um, so I could have a maximum of seven unpaired electrons at some particular state. So again, uh, we're not going to go into what is the maximum moment that we could get for any particular atom, but the thing to remember here is that magnetic uh, moments on are particular to atoms, and they're based on how many electrons are in those atoms and which orbitals are they filling. So for example, iron would not necessarily have the same magnetic moment as iron 2 plus or as iron 3 plus, because in each of those cases, we have different uh, numbers of electrons, and so orbits, orbitals are filled differently. Okay, so we have this picture. Each atom can have some magnetic moment. A solid is just a whole bunch of atoms put together, right? So if each atom uh, has an independent magnetic moment, so let's think about this one, uh, and if it's not aligning with any of its neighbors, then I would get no net magnetization. So I would call this a magnetically disordered system. There is a magnetic moment on each atom, but they're not all aligned, so I would see no net magnetization in the system. And we call this a paramagnet. Now, if I cool this paramagnet down, in some cases, I can get all of those atomic moments to align. And that's what we call a ferromagnet. So this is what we think of um, as a permanent magnet, something that has a permanent aligned magnetic field. And in order to do that, it must have atoms that are uh, aligned. There is some interaction energy between these different uh, atoms that says it's going to be beneficial. It's the whole system will establish a lower overall energy if they're all pointing in the same direction. So again, this is what we call a ferromagnet. Now, if I take any ferromagnet and I start heating it up, at some point, I'm gonna put enough thermal energy in there that that thermal energy will overweigh um, the benefit I get from the atoms, the, the magnetic moments on the atoms lining up. So I would see a curve that looks something like this. The, saturation magnetization, so the total magnetic moment that I could get in that material, uh, will decrease as I increase the temperature. So I'm putting in more thermal energy, the system's becoming more and more disordered, and at some point, and I would call this the Curie temperature, the system is no longer ordered. All of those atomic moments are now going to be free to take different directions. So this is one kind of a transition in magnetic material systems, a transition between a ferromagnet and a paramagnet. And all ferromagnets at some point, if I heat them up to high enough temperature, they'll become paramagnetic. So that's why, um, I don't know if anybody would remember these, but if you take something that's magnetic, like an audio tape, uh, and you expose it to very, very hot temperature conditions. So say you leave it in a car in Texas in the middle of summer, um, you can inadvertently start losing the memory on that audio tape because the magnetic moments are now free to um, spin, free to rearrange their directions. And so you can lose that magnetization. Now, uh, important thing is that if I cool this system back down, once again, my magnetic uh, atoms would again want to rearrange themselves so they're all pointing in the same direction, but that doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same direction as it was pointing originally. So that's where you can lose your information. Okay, so in summary, uh, magnetism is deriving from unpaired electrons, and there are two contributions. There's an electronic spin, and there's an orbital angular momentum contribution. And these two things can interact and can lead up to uh, the magnetic moment on a given atom or on a given ion. Now, when we think about uh, magnetization, so bulk magnetization in solid materials, we think about this as re requiring an interaction between these neighboring magnetic atoms. And that's what we call a ferromagnetic material. That's when those atoms are all 
um, their magnetic moments are all aligned in the same direction. All ferromagnetic materials, if I heat them up to high enough temperature, will disorder. Um, that disorder point is what we call the Curie temperature. I can have other sorts of magnetic order, but we're not going to get into those in this case.